All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be able to welcome Alison Graham, who is up in Canada in Ontario. How are you doing, Alison? Fantastic. Lovely to uh, connect with you. Yeah. And, you know, Alison is an expert author, media contributor, and talks about problem solving and resiliency. Uh, and uh, just your latest book, you've just come out now, is Take Back Your Weekends, Stress Less, Do More, Be Happier. Well, you know, who would, who would argue with that? Who wouldn't want that? Who so wouldn't just, uh, want that? That's what I say. <laughs> exactly. So um, so let's talk about, uh, right. let's talk about it, uh, go back to the start and uh, talk about uh, the genesis of this second book. Because your, your other books included Married My Mom, Birth of the Dog, How to Be Resilient When Life Sucks, and From Business Cards to Business Relationships. Why, why a book about taking back weekends? Well, I remember the first time I said, take back your weekends. And I was actually working with an executive team and about 2.30 in the afternoon on the retreat, one of the executives started to cry. And he said, look, he said, I am so afraid I'm going to miss my kid's childhood because there's so much work to do. The weeks are, there's just so many interruptions. I can't get it all done. And I work every Saturday and Sunday and it's still not enough. And I said, well, then it's time to take back your weekends. <laughs> and that was the beginning. And, and, you know, really, it's not about whether or not you choose to work on a Saturday and a Sunday, go for it, right? Like I would be a hypocrite to say, don't work on the weekend because I do. I often feel very inspired to work on the weekends. Mm -hmm. The key is though, to have a choice. And what concerns me is that there's so much of a hustle culture, which I'm all for the hustle, right? Like bring it on. And we, we need to be able to relax without the guilt and to recharge. And that's when our best creativity comes forward. And all of those pieces of the puzzle that we want, innovation, creativity, uh, productivity, that's in, intensified when we have time off. And so this is really a, about a way of thinking, a way of living to embrace and love our work while we embrace the the relaxation at the same time yeah that's no, a great point and and you're right about the you know about the hustle culture and i mean that's the culture we live in but i also think it's um we we live in a culture also that celebrates activity right so they think if you're constantly in most constantly doing things constantly working then you must be you must be contributing rather than looking at you know are we doing things efficiently what are the results what are the outcomes of it and to your point is it even a healthy way to operate right exactly and i think you know i used to have a lot of judgment myself because i wouldn't i especially if you know the early story of my career when i started to creating these resilience uh, techniques mm -hmm. was i had to take time off i was an 18 hour a day girl i was like keep gonna go I, apparently my air conditioning's not on my glasses keep fogging up oh, i'm okay. just switch my glasses i just <laughs> got them and they're they're pretty they have this really weird thing so anyway yeah. costume change midway um so I was, I was somebody who judged myself. So when I wanted to, like before I had a surgery that, you know, caused neuropathic pain, that there were five more surgeries, hundreds of doctor's appointments that really inspired this journey for me, I had a post-it note on my, win, on my mirror and it said, deserve to hit the pillow. Like every day I was holding myself to the standard that was unattainable. And I think eventually if we just kind of use busy, 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 busy to avoid the truth of our lives, uh, life is going to catch up with us. And so it did for me and it, it made me go from working 18 hour days to, you know, two to five hours of functionality in a day. And the irony was I actually was more productive. My output puts per hour were increased. So I did more in less amount of time. I was having a higher quality of work because it was just like, I was only doing the thing that really mattered. And I, but then I, I'd get to this point where I'd be like, okay, now my body is done and I'm going to watch, you know, Netflix wasn't on back then. Thank goodness. I would have been in big trouble, yeah. but I would just beat myself up. Like you're so lazy and like, you know, all this, stuff. but the truth is my body was recovering. Yeah. And that's what I want people to be okay with both sides of the spectrum. We need the high intensity and we need 
the, the, the low intensity so that we can optimize our high intensity. Yeah. And I mean, there's a number of things I wanted to come back on, but it's funny what you just mentioned there about, uh, you know, you have to you have to let your mind and body recover because otherwise it's like it's like if you do if you do any kind of sports, it's like playing with an injury. You know, you the when the injury needs rest, right, the injury only becomes worse if you continue um, without giving it that rest and recuperation period. And that's often a hard thing for people to do. And I think the same thing is in work it's hard for people to listen to their bodies and minds which are telling them like i'm i'm burned out right because then it becomes a collapse mm -hmm. at least that was my old pattern so mm -hmm. i would work 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 get the job done get keep going go 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 collapse friday night you know maybe spend 24 hours going i can't do anything anymore and then like come back and heaven forbid anybody knew i was taking that time off mm -hmm. <laughs> right like yeah. you know that i was collapsing uh, you mentioned something else there. I just wanted to come back on, and that was the idea of setting an un uh, setting an unattainable goal, right? So yours was like in your mind, like deserve to hit the pillow, right? Deserve you have done so much stuff that you deserve to to sleep. Uh, and I think this is the problem with a lot of people is that setting. It's good to set stretch goals. It's good to you know to shoot for something that's really difficult. But constantly putting unattainable targets out there, it gives you an excuse never to finish. Mm, yeah, it's a nice way to hide, isn't it? Yeah, it really is like, you know, I'm working towards this goal. It's funny today, I did a, a talk around impatience, and how mm. impatient we can be. And so, you know, looking for that goal. And so there's the other side of it, too, right? If we can attach ourselves to the joy of all of the steps it takes to build a goal, we can mm -hmm. actually you know, be more successful and, and happier as we go along the road. But yeah, there's, when you, when you put these big grandiose ideas out there of what you think is required in order for you to feel like you deserve or to feel like you are enough, that you are quote unquote successful, it's just, you're, you're chasing a carrot that's always being moved. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. And uh, and I think the other thing that you mentioned there, which I think is really incredibly important for everybody, is that idea of when you figure out when you figured out what was important to do. And I think that's the thing is that we sit around today and we make our to do lists and everything is a priority on it. And we're, we're terrible at prioritizing and we're terrible at pushing back too. sometimes. I think people are afraid because of the culture, pervasive culture that we live in, afraid of going uh, listen, I'm overwhelmed. I've got way too much stuff to do. Let's just sit down and figure out what are the critical pieces here. Yeah. So I actually, I got a call today from a service provider who I had reached out to and said, Hey, I need your service. Can you, uh, you know, help me? And he took three days to call me back and he didn't, he just left me a voicemail before we came on to our zoom mm -hmm. call. And he said, look, I'm too stretched right now to serve you properly. I don't want to leave you hanging. Here's somebody else who can help you. And I was like, you know what? Good on you, buddy. Like, mm -hmm. I, I'm impressed because he could take it on and then push me off and push me off and push me off and not deliver. And so often we have so much guilt and emotion around uh, saying no and setting boundaries and figuring out what do we need to do. And a lot of my coaching work is with men and women who are so in over their head because they are saying yes to everybody except for themselves. Yeah, and I think that's an excellent point as well, is like putting yourself in last place always and then wondering why that why it's becoming harder and harder for you to deliver. Right. And that like you're just not going to win the race doing that. Right. Whatever race you think you're in, uh, it's just going to get progressively more frustrating and more frustrating. And so a lot of the work in Take Back Your Weekends is not about having a to do list. It's about making peace with the fact that a list will never end right? It's actually a task circle. It's going to just keep going round and round and round. Yeah. And the sooner we can emotionally disconnect from that reality, the more, the, the faster we can take control of our time and our emotional connection to how we're spending our time. Yeah. And you talk about good versus destructive stress. So what is good stress compared to destructive stress? How do you know the difference? Mm. Okay, so good stress will do one of three things. It will inspire you. It will focus you. And it will keep you alive. 
So it's our stress reaction. It's our danger, danger. Let me get to safety. And the point of stress was supposed to be like, if we're in the garden and the bear comes along, it, you know, all our hormones shoot up and then we get to safety and then they're supposed to come back down to our baseline. The problem is most people are running around their office building thinking a bear is chasing them, right? With the same level of uh, hormones Mm -hmm. kicking in and our to-do list is not a predator, right? So what that, that to me is good stress when we use it in, uh, so this idea of up and down, up and down, recovery, up, down. And so what we want to do is use that strategically Mm -hmm. using our focus work blocks, having goals, but we can't be chasing a goal all the time. We need to have finite, I'm going to chase this and I'm going to, you know, maybe work a little bit more intensely today. And then tomorrow I'm going to, you know, have that part of the goal done and come back down. So that's good stress when we're using it effectively. Destructive stress is anything that will take you away from your sweet spot of performance, productivity, and profitability. These are the things when we start to feel uh, an emotional reaction or a physical reaction, a lot of anxiety comes, a lot of overwhelm, a lot Mm. of feeling like just buzzy, like I can't deal with everything I have to do. To me, that means you're, you've skipped over the line and it's a fine line and it's a little different for everybody. But if we start getting into those sensations, instead of feeling energized and inspired and focused, then we're switching over into the destructive stress. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's something that, unfortunately, it's a state, it's almost a permanent state that a lot of people uh, operate in and ultimately, obviously, ultimately it'll catch up in you because as well, I mean, sometimes people read these things about other people and yeah we're such into comparison culture and we're so into other it's like oh i read that whatever you know whatever guru you want like oh steve jobs slept one hour every week that was it and worked all the rest of the time and you think that's that's the secret to success and i think that we don't always realize that different people have different ways of operating and one person's way of operating is not necessarily the right one for you and mightn't even have been the right one for them ultimately Well, and this is the thing, because we just get stuck in our pattern. So they may only Mm -hmm. sleep for one hour a night because he has insomnia, right? Mm -hmm. And is miserable for, and I don't know, Steve Jobs, obviously, you know, maybe he enjoyed that. But there are a lot of people who sleep for three hours a night where it is a badge of honor. But the truth of the matter is, is they're walking around exhausted and like a zombie and their, their work productivity would actually increase if they took more time to, you know, go to a sleep clinic and figure out why they can't sleep. (laughs) And there are other people who, you know what, that's all they need. And by golly, go for it. And how are you going to use that? But do you need to use all of those extra hours working? Or could you do something else that you could really truly uh, also enjoy or spend time with your family or your friends or however else you want to spend time? Yeah, and, and figure out what works for you in balance because it's like the same thing. It's like you know, people are different. It's whether you're doing a job or a sport or whatever, whatever it is, is like you know, not a, it's not going to work for everyone. Um, the other thing that I noticed, you talk about the quest for control, and I think this idea of control is the one that on uh, really uh, unravels us so much because we 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 have this strange, I always think, conflict or paradox going on that. You know, life, we can't control what happens. Life happens, things happen, change is constant. But somehow when we get into work, we try and corral everything and try to keep complete control over it and ourselves. And it just is completely at odds with the way the world works. It is completely at odds. You would think we would figure that out by the time we get to our middle age, right? But we don't, Mm -hmm. Uh, not always. And so really looking at it objectively, I think one of the reasons we get caught up in this control cycle is because we're not being completely aware of the situation or our self-awareness, how we're responding to a situation and potentially how we're making it worse. And so whenever that happens, I'm always the person who says, turn to pen and paper. What's Mm -hmm. the real issue? What's going on? What about it is within my control? What's without out of my control? And being compassionately curious with yourself around your control issues, right? Not judgmental because the problem with self-awareness is that it can skip very quickly into self-judgment and criticism. Mm -hmm. And nobody's making any progress when we get over there. 
So let's look at it from a lens of compassionate curiosity and go, hmm, what about this makes me feel uncomfortable that I feel like I need to control the situation more? And what parts of it could I lean into the fact that I have no control over that? I think one of the things that COVID did for us was recognize that people who thought that they were absolutely in control and had a path laid out for their future, I very quickly realized that there is no control. We don't mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. And so we can only show up how we show up, how we respond and the activities that we choose to do with our time. That's where we can place our best control. Yeah, and, and I agree with you. And I think uh, COVID was a great, um, it was a lesson for people in many ways. But it's been my experience. I originally came to the States from Ireland and I came during the dot com era. And since I've been living in the States now 25 years or whatever, I've gone, we've had the dot com implosion, 9 11, had the financial crisis, now we have COVID. So it just seems to me that there's something fairly catastrophic happens uh, every every so often now probably more regularly than it even used to and therefore you have you have to kind of take a step back and realize that all your plans could be thrown up in the air so you have to have that sort of flexibility built in right and recognizing when you don't have flexibility like in yourself Mm -hmm. because if we don't shine a light on the patterns that we show up like how we're showing up in the world we're just going to keep repeating and repeating and repeating and so how like my challenge to the listeners is how can you lean into the suckage and be okay with it because Mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is there's always going to be stuff going on around us and if you're emotionally reacting to all of that change all of those elements that are out of your control then you're constantly going to be in a state of push pull push pull completely Mm -hmm. out of control the irony is is when you try to control the things out of your control you're you're actually in less control because the things are controlling you as opposed to you just being like i got this you know what suck it around me i'm gonna live Mm -hmm. with that what can I deal with? What are the obstacles I need to do? What are the tasks I need to do? What are the obstacles I need to solve? And then being available for the adversities in your life and truly processing those and having the time to do that. Yeah, it's funny because I, I I read the book a while ago, of um, The Outpost, and that, that was made into a movie recently about um, Afghanistan when these uh, this platoon or whatever was deployed to the worst um outpost you could possibly get like in a valley surrounded by mountains surrounded by the enemy but um to cut a long story short when he arrived there the first thing he saw written on with the wall or the bunks was like embrace the suck and he said that that's what got them through a lot of things because anytime things are really bad they just look at each other and say embrace the suck that's right and we're not in a war zone although yeah, some of us may exactly. feel like it in our yeah. you know businesses depending on how things are going for you the 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 principle remains the same yeah right and it's just varying degrees of suckage exactly exactly um and uh, which is which is and i think and i think that's another important point sometimes when you're reaching those high levels of stress right yeah if you're in the middle of a war zone it's a matter of life and death for the rest of us it's 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 rarely if ever a, a matter of life and death and sometimes perspective and context you know we need to lean into a little bit more absolutely Pearl, pers- pers- perspective is a huge f- part of my philosophy right yeah. like let's uh, and and here's the thing though i do want to say because some people will say to me i know these are first world problems i know that yeah. i shouldn't be upset about this and i'm like yeah but you actually are upset about this. So we need to learn how to shift your perspective so that that thing is no longer upsetting you. And so denial is not a great strategy either, (laughs) right? Like, you know, and turning yourself off to, you know, feeling like I'm angry about that or I'm disappointed or I'm frustrated or I'm overwhelmed. All those sensations, those emotions are actually great cues for us figuring out how, how do we move and create a better path forward? Yeah, as long as it doesn't, as long as that anger doesn't stray into what somebody coined on this podcast a while back is re- recreational anger, which I think unfortunately has afflicted an awful lot of people where they're constantly angry, looking for ways to be angry, looking to get into arguments online or whatever, where it's become almost an addiction. So, yeah, you, use your anger in the correct way to be angered about things on um, that matter, but proportionally. 
proportionately. Absolutely. Great point, proportionately. <laughs> and I would actually think a lot of that online anger and attacking and whatnot is actually a, a result of misplaced emotion. Mm -hmm. So, and I talk about this in the book as well. So we have you know, our emotions. So perhaps you're concerned about job security, perhaps you're concerned about cash flow, or, you know, your spouse just got angry with you and threatened divorce, like whatever the case mm -hmm. may be. And so then you go online and somebody has this little thing that they're going to say, right. And you're like, I don't like that. And you've taken mm -hmm. all this emotion yeah. that's not effectively processed for this thing that actually matters in your life and you put it over here. And that's where we get this recreational anger coming from because it's a whole bunch of true anger that is legitimate for something in your life, but is not applicable to all things that you interact with. And so this is where the situational awareness, self-awareness and solution activation principles, uh, the formula, the problem solving framework in my book is so critical because if somebody notices that they're doing a lot of engaging online and a lot of anger, then I would say, okay, go through the problem solving framework and let's figure it out and let's change the pattern. Yeah, I, I, I should probably uh, put a referral for your book on Nextdoor, that app, because uh, there seems to be an awful lot of people who spend an awful lot of time on that getting very, very angry. And to the point, your point, you're going, could you really be this angry about this, really? Mm, probably not but <laughs> probably it feels not. good to release anger right like anger needs to like emotion all emotions the good and the bad need to flow like they need an outlet to go somewhere and if they don't we just stuff them down and then we end up with like diagnoses right like you know cancer yeah. and all that kind yeah. of stuff they, they stress related diseases right yeah, yeah and so you want a healthy way to share it and it's probably not on the latest yeah, and greatest about, internet yeah, app. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, listen, this is fantastic, Alison. The book is Take Back Your Weekend, Stress Less, Do More, Be Happier. And as I said at the outset, who wouldn't want that? Um, all of the, all of Alison's information is going to be below this uh, video, including links to the book. Uh, but before we go, Alison, please do hold up the book. Tell us a little bit more about what you do. Sure, absolutely. So my, my work is really rooted in the belief that I believe that people are stressed unnecessarily. And so strategies to help you deal with that avoid burnout. And I share my message in a few different ways, primarily speaking at conferences, the keynote speaker, and I work with executive teams on their leading their resilience in their culture, and of course, coaching 101. And I'm going to invite your listeners, I have a weekly lift up. It's a one minute read. You can go to alisongraham.co backslash lift dash up and get on that list because it'll just give you, you know, a little positive influx <laughs> in the uh, and some sort of a really quick strategy each week, as opposed to all of the negativity that is out there surrounding in, in the Internet. Yeah, listen, fantastic. And I would encourage people to do that. I encourage people to check out the book as well. Uh, my name is John Golden. Thank you for listening and watching. And thank you, Alison. And I'll see you all again soon.